Hello, welcome to the web mardi. So uh, due to the sanitary measure, we are online again. And tonight, uh, it's going to be as usual when we do it online. We're going to have this short introduction about the web mardi. Then we're going to have Pierre giving his talk. We will be gathering, uh, gathering all the questions from the chat 
and then uh, Pierre will be answering all those questions at the end of the talk. So if ever you have any question, please write it down in the comments in YouTube. And then we'll announce the next web mardi. So um, maybe you already know, but the web mardi has a quite whole meetup and we gather every first two day of each month to talk about anything related to the dev, to the web, sorry, that can be something like a new framework or um, something about design, project management, whatever. And uh, we usually held those events in Romandie, so basically in Lausanne, Fribourg, or Geneva. And the WebMandie is a non-profitable association, and it's run by Camille, Nelson, Kevin, Daniela, Justine, and myself. Um, we couldn't do that uh, without the support from Leap and Antistatic. They help us to get the finance, to pay all the tools we need, the apero, et cetera, et cetera. We also have sponsors such as JetBrains, Infomaniac, and Smashing Magazine. Voila. Okay, so uh, tonight we welcome Pierre. Adieu. Salut, Pierre. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Uh, just for the one who don't know Pierre already, uh, I have a little story to share. Pierre is one of the founder of the WebMardi. So the WebMardi uh, was founded in twenty uh, uh, in in two thousand and eight. And and we were we were sixteen or twelve back then. <laughs> I was, obviously for sure <laughs> awesome uh so how do you feel about like giving a talk because you were like behind web money for many years and tonight you're giving a talk how does that feel for you oh um i don't know i think uh, starting Web Marty led me to be a speaker, so this helped me. Like I never spoke at Web Marty, but I really wanted to do the same. So, um, do I back then worked at Leap, who's a sponsor here, uh, who then also helped a lot of people uh, and told them if you want to go and speak at a conference, go. We help you, and I've been doing my fair share of speaking at conferences, so it, it feels quite okay. It kind of le, le cercle qui se ferme, so the, the circle closes. <laughs> kind of, and maybe that's my last talk because I think, yeah, children and all. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it won't be your last talk because you always have something interesting to share. So, anyway, I have I to say that the Web Marty also did a fantastic job. I mean, you guys have been, I've never had this. Uh, so, usually you, you say what you want to talk about and then you go there and people hope it's not going to be too boring. Um, uh, these guys at the WebMardi, I mean, we started talking three weeks ago on a weekly basis, looking at the slides, helping me. So you guys are doing a fantastic job. And if anyone wants to speak and uh, has never spoken yet, uh, this is a good place to start because you'll, you'll have a lot of support. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Okay, I won't take much more time uh, because that's your place, that's your talk. So I will give you the hand and let's start with your talk. Thank you, Pierre. Thanks. So yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, databases, uh, different types of databases that are out there, maybe a bit of history. Uh, after that, we'll jump into the Graphile suite, uh, suite of uh, libraries that are around PostGraphile, Graphile Migrate, Graphile Worker, which uh, and Graphile Starter, which all build on top of Postgres. And uh, at the end, I'll do a le little demo of uh, Graphile Starter. Let me just quickly drink. One shouldn't drink coffee before a talk. Um, databases. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, this is Douglas Adams, who's written Hitchhiker's Guide Through Galaxy. And he famously once said, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And for me, this is what databases are. They are 100% magic. Uh, I, I really don't understand what's going on in there, uh, but I love them. And 
if you want to know what a database is, obviously you go to Wikipedia and uh, you'll find a definition. It says that a database is an organized collection of data uh, which is stored and accessed electronically, which basically is Excel or anything that can store data. Um, if you think of it, Excel itself is also very magic, uh, apart from the fact that it exists since 1985, where it was first released on the Macintosh. It is a tool that uh, empowers many non-programmers to write very complex programs. And so, as such, it is magic. It must be a database. Um, Wikipedia goes on to say that um, the more complex databases are often developed using formal design and modeling techniques. And depending on how formal and how it is modeled, uh, we can basically differentiate databases in two types of databases, general purpose databases and special purpose databases. So a special purpose database, um, it's a recursive definition, uh, serves a special purpose. Um, if you think about them, there's, for example, uh, Redis, uh, which can be used as a cache or as a message broker. Uh, there are document databases or NoSQL databases like MongoDB or uh, time series databases. Uh, time series databases I really love. Um, they give you the possibility to just throw uh, data, timed data at them, and then you can get aggregates out by the second or by a century, and it's very helpful. Um, but none of these databases can be used for anything else than their special purpose, or they shouldn't, because sometimes people try, especially in this one, to store user data and probably even financial transactions, even you shouldn't. Um, these are special purpose databases. They are very good at very specific tasks, and if you use them right, uh, they will help you get from zero to a finished product in a very short time. But as soon as you start to use them for something else more general, uh, usually you end up shooting yourself in the foot. And this is what we have general purpose databases for. Um, these you can throw any kind of data at, and kind of, as the definition of Wikipedia said, organize, collect, and access uh, this data. Usually this data is put into relation to each other in general purpose databases, which means, as an example, if you have an address where someone can live, a person, and this person works maybe at a company, we put that in relation. Then again, a company can have an address, and this is the same table in the database, and all of that is in relation in a relational database. And all of this started basically a long, long time ago. Uh, in the 1970s, um, Ted Codd wrote a paper. He was at the IBM Research Lab, and uh, I never read this paper, probably never will. <laughs> but this is what started all, and a lot of people read it, and it kick-started many corporations like IBM and Oracle and universities to start to implement this idea of uh, something that seems obvious to us now, putting data into relation. Um, one of these databases that was started at Berkeley University was Ingress, uh, very short after that paper came out. Uh, they already had a lot of money, which uh, a grant they got to make a geographical database. They even had a name, Ingress, and then they read the paper and they were like, oh, we should maybe try this relational thing. They kept the name and uh, worked on it. Uh, in 1982, so one of the lead developers, uh, Stone Breaker, left the Ingress team uh, uh, from Berkeley and tried to make a proper, I knew I would not manage that word, proprietary version of Ingress. And this proprietary version of Ingress was very good. So it, it was uh, competing uh, with Oracle back then. But in 85, the same person, Stone Breaker came back to Berkeley because he wanted to work a bit more on this database and add uh, more things like user-defined types, etc. And he started a new project called Postgres for post 
Ingress. This uh, database, both Ingress and Postgres, used a query language. Query language is, as the name says, a, a language to query the database to get the data out, uh, called Quell for query language. And uh, it was very close to another paper that Ted Codd also wrote back in the 70s. In parallel, IBM developed a new query language, which was much easier to read and write. It was um, very close to English. As you can see, you do select from student table where state equals Florida. It's, it's kind of readable. And they wanted to call it SQL um, because, well, it comes after Quell and it's better. But for legal reasons that have nothing to do with Ingress, uh, they couldn't use that name. So they called it SQL. Um, to this day, everyone says SQL when they see SQL, which is funny that this is such an old story. Many databases adopted this query language and most, if not all, relational databases nowadays use SQL. Postgres uh, started using SQL in 1994, uh, renamed their project to PostgreSQL so that you would know it uses SQL. But to this day, people call it Postgres. Postgres has many, many, many features and um, way too many to list them all. So I'll try to list some of them uh, in order to maybe show why it makes sense to use a database like Postgres instead of a, I don't know, uh, NoSQL database. Um, first thing is that, <clears throat> losing my voice. So, the first thing is that the transactions which are sent to the database are atomic. Uh, that means that, um, so all, all we say they are acid, uh, acid transactions, they are atomic, sorry, they are consistent, isolated, and durable. Um, all of this basically means that if there are multiple uh, transactions going on the database, multiple people changing the data, um, the database will always end up in a consistent state. It will uh, throw if it's not capable, so you will get informed. So if, if one of the transactions doesn't work because in parallel something else was changed, and the system, the durability is that uh, if, the, if the database crashes while uh, there is a read or write, uh, there is a write happening, it will always remain in a consistent state. And this is basically what to me makes the is is the magic part of a database i i can i can throw pretty much what i want at it um and in in any order and it will survive and be in a good state um in addition to having acid compliant transactions uh, some i could some of the features are that uh, Postgres has triggers, which means that if you change parts of the database, it will automatically run some code. Uh, imagine, like we would call that callbacks in uh, in regular coding. Um, we have foreign keys, which uh, seems very normal, but is was novel at some point. That means if you, for example, have a user uh, that uh, lives at a certain address and you try to delete the address, uh, it's not possible because the user uh, still points towards this address. Um, we have stored procedures. This will be very important in what follows. Uh, what that means is that you can write very complex functions in the database itself. Uh, you can even write these in JavaScript, which is, uh, I think, 10 years ago this started which is quite crazy. And basically what we want to do is write most of our business logic in the database itself, because then uh, it, it lives where the data lives. Um, and in 2016, Postgres added a row level security. And what that means, if you imagine a table with loads of users, you could say that any logged in user is allowed to read uh, the name or the username of a user or its avatar, but only the user owning one row can modify that. And this all in the database. 
And there are many more things, one of them being the JSON type, where you can, in one column of a data, uh, of the database, uh, of a table, uh, define that uh, something is of a type JSON. So you can throw in any kind of structured data, but the database can uh, create indexes, indices on it, which means it can query quite quickly on this JSON. And this replaces probably the need for most of uh, of the times we uh, needed a NoSQL database, uh, maybe 10 years ago still. So yeah, this is uh, what I want to tell you about Postgres. It's quite magic. I love it and it performs. And uh, many people would maybe think that Postgres is not a good idea because it's a monolith. What that means is usually when you work with Postgres, you have one instance of the database and that's not um, easily uh, decentralized. But for 99% of the projects, I think this will be okay. Uh, there was a blog post in the middle of this year by a Notion who just sharded their database, which means they took one instance and made two, where they separated the data by organizations of uh, their users. And they said that they had to start thinking about sharding when they had 4 million concurrent users hitting this one single database. So if you learn to optimize your database a bit and you do your queries in a pretty smart way, you will probably survive in 99% of the projects with a single database without any problem. So now that we've seen the different types of database and established how brilliant uh, Postgres is as a general purpose database, um, we can start looking at the Graphile suite. Um, Graphile is basically a bunch of open source projects that uh, make up the entire Graphile suite, um, starting with Postgraphile. Postgraphile is a JavaScript library written in TypeScript, which you can point at a database. It will analyze your database. It will check what kind of tables you have, users, addresses, companies, etc., And we will automatically create a GraphQL API for you. It basically removes the need to write a lot of glue code that you, I don't know, would write in Express uh, in order to, you know, get a user and, and its blog post, etc. cetera. Um, there are many features that uh, we can point out uh, with regard to PostgreSQL. Uh, I won't go over all of them. But basically, the biggest thing, I think that's at least what drew me towards PostgreSQL, is that you don't have a, the so-called n plus 1 problem. Um, so if you don't know about GraphQL, GraphQL is basically a query language where from the front end, you query uh, an API. And instead of doing REST, uh, you do uh, GraphQL which is a query language, graph query language, and you create a graph. So you could, instead of, you know, in REST getting one user and then finding out what all their posts are, blog posts, and then getting each of these blog posts one after the other, you could say, uh, give me, I don't know, five users, the five users who wrote uh, blog posts last and their last five blog posts. And you do this as one query. The, that seems very easy in the front end. It's very, very simple, but it becomes very complex to write um, a backend for GraphQL, especially if you do it, I don't know, in Express and you you have to start to think about how, how am I going to get this data out of the database? And usually that's the n plus one problem is, oh, you get the five users, that's one. And then for all these five users, you do need to do n queries. So five queries in order to get their last blog posts. Because PostgreSQL knows how the database is structured, it can actually magically, probably, there's probably some magic in there as well. It can create uh, one SQL statement for any kind of GraphQL request you throw at it. And this makes it very, very, very performant. PostgreSQL is also super secure. 
Um, why? Because as I alluded before, we have row level authentication in Postgres since 2016, uh, which I've never seen used before. Uh, but what Postgres GraphQ, sorry, what PostGraphQL, um, <laughs> what PostGraphile, I think it was called PostGraphQL first. I don't know. What PostGraphile does is that it leverages basically this role based access control and role level security. Uh, basically, every user. Uh, of your system will become a user of the database and they will only be allowed to access the data that the database tells them they are. And again, this is instead of writing glue code, you configure your database correctly. It doesn't mean you have less work, but the work is probably more interesting. It's I'd rather solve a problem where I teach my, I tell my database what, who is allowed to see what then having to go over two, three, four, five different endpoints and thinking, is this then no, yes. And so it, it takes away a complexity. It gives you a new complexity, which is actually a good one to solve. Because if you solve that, you could basically give your users access to the database directly and they couldn't uh, put it into a state that is not good. Another feature of uh, PostgreSQL is that it's hot reloading. So whenever you change your database schema, so the schema tells you, you know, what are the row, the columns in your tables? Do I have a username? Do I have a, an email address? Do I have a bio? Whenever we change that structure, it will automatically recreate the entire PostgreSQL API and all the types that go along. And we'll see later that you can push these types automatically to the front end and have them in your front end. So PostgreSQL was one of these libraries that come uh, in this GraphFile ecosystem. Uh, the next one is GraphFile Migrate. So I, the last thing I said was, right, your GraphQL API will automatically reload when the database changes. Changing that database is called a migration. So. Again, adding, I don't know, a bio to a user. The good thing about, and there's many, many, many migration um, libraries out there, but this one does something a bit different. At least it's the only one I know that works that way. Uh, it basically, you have a current uh, migration script in which you see what, in which you write uh, your migrations. And as soon as you hit save, um, this migration will be executed and the database will be changed on development. It's extremely quick, which also means that if I continue adding uh, content here and save again, uh, this first line, which changes the table to add a bio uh, will obviously be uh, throwing an error because the database already has this column on the user table, which is why when we work with GraphFile Migrate, uh, we always need to start by adding at the top of our file uh, the code that will revert the database into its initial state and then add the changes. It's a bit different. So you don't have this up and down that you usually have, but it's extremely quick. The next part of the puzzle is um, GraphFile Worker. Um, I think that's brilliant. It's a job queue uh, that runs on top of Postgres. And that is, let's say, a thing I miss on most of the projects I've ever worked on. So I, I'm always telling everyone, oh, we should add a job queue to the project, but then I don't do it and no one else does it because we don't have time to do it. And then uh, once you need the job queue, you start hacking it yourself because you don't have the time to do it correctly. And the job queue would be something like, I don't know, a user registers um, and you should send them an email and you don't want to send that email in the request that registers the user. You want to do it later. So you, you add this to a job queue and when the server has time, it will work on that. And Graphile, uh, the Graphile environment comes with a worker that's very tightly coupled with everything else. Obviously you can use it um, 
uh, with Postgres instead of Postgres file, and it works very well with these kinds of environments. Sorry. So this leads us to the last piece of this graphile puzzle, uh, which is the graphile starter. And this gives the graphile environment almost a framework kind of nature. Um, it's a starter that you can just check out and uh, initialize it comes with post graphile graphile migrate graphile worker on top of node.js on top of express uh, obviously as i said it will automatically generate uh, your graphql api including typescript types that can be used in next.js so yes it comes uh, with next.js in the front end and react and it even is very easily deployable to heroku so you have very little steps to follow to actually deploy this starter to Heroku. Uh, it comes pre-configured with a user management system with all the bells and whistles, including sending emails during development. You see them in your command line. Uh, you can create uh, organizations, add users to organizations, all the things you would need for a business to business kind of application. Obviously you can remove all of that if you don't need it. Uh, the whole thing runs um, on a UI library called Ant Design, which is easily replaceable if you don't like it, but it helps you get started quickly, especially if you want to rapid prototype something. And uh, as I mentioned, it works. Uh, the front end is written in Next. Now, this all sounds wonderful, but, and I mean, that's from <laughs> the the documentation of uh, the graphite starter it's not for beginners whatever that means um i am a beginner we're all beginners what, what this means is you have to be prepared to change the way you work and to learn a lot of things that you don't know uh, i i've been interested in post file for a bit over a year now i've never used it professionally and i think i'm definitely not ready to use it professionally to develop something quickly, but I think it would be worth the investment. Even if I had a client who pays for it, it would be worth because uh, the result I think is, is going to be uh, great. So check it out, play with it. It has an amazing documentation. It will really lead you, take you by the hand and tell you what you need to know in order to work with it. It will teach you about, like it, it, it will explain all of the concepts it has, how it logs in into the database. Uh, even if they migrate from one version to the other, this entire thing is documented uh, ad extremis. Uh, as I said, it, it takes you by the hand on how to deploy something to Heroku. And most importantly, um, Graphile is open source software. And it isn't necessarily the type of open source software we've come to get used to, which I, in the recent years, like Next.js, which wow, it's brilliant, it's open source, but behind is a big company who has investors and tries to make a lot of money. It's basically, developed by Benji and Jem, um, who live in England and who work on it with a lot of love and and live basically from a little bit of um, consulting and sponsorship uh, from users like you and me. Uh, they do everything from code to documentation. They have a Discord channel, which is very, very good. Uh, the community is amazing and they're really helpful. So even if you start, you just go in and there's no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, there's just a concept you don't understand yet and they are very helpful. So if you don't sponsor a project yet on GitHub, I would say even if you don't use it yet, uh, I think it's a good project to sponsor. So think of them. Um, so I promised you a demo. And before we start the demo, I want to emphasize the two things that are basically the ones that I want to show in the demo. One is how immediate this whole thing is. So uh, for on, on one side, obviously we're doing things in a different way. Everything is in the database, et cetera. So, my initial expectation was, okay, 
development will be annoying, right? I need to go and run my migrations by hand. I need to make sure. Of it. So we'll see that this is not the case. It's super immediate. But also what's really important and what I'm, what hopefully I'm trying to convey and I managed to convey is that all of your configuration or all of your code lives in the database where it should live. You will write your business logic in the database and as close, the closer you get to the database with your business logic, the less chances of corrupting the meaning of this data. Obviously, you can't corrupt the database, but you can corrupt the meaning. Um, the less chances you will have with that. Um, my experience is that databases are usually a data dump and that you have some glue code somewhere in an express controller or in the front end. <laughs> And, and then over time, this data dump becomes inconsistent and it lies to you. And my feeling is that using Postgraph file, this will not happen. You will work a lot, just as much as usually, but probably the code will be better in the end. So uh, we will quickly look. So this is the uh, registration field and we will see that so we have a user and a username and the name. Uh, which are which can be migrated uh, which can be changed by the user uh, but i'd like to uh, add a bio field um, so here we are basically in the callback code that is called when you hit the submit button um, this uh, so that's the function up here which gets called um, it will patch uh, send a patch to the server uh, with a username and the name, which are in this uh, chain form to change your username. Uh, if we now add a bio, TypeScript will complain and it will tell you uh, this field does not exist on the user patch. So what we do next is that we go into our current migration. The green stuff is comments. Uh, we go into this uh, migration and we modify the table. Uh, which table? We modify the table of the user. And we will, on this user table, add a column, which is the column bio, and it's made of text. Uh, once we save, you can see that uh, in the terminal, things are running. So it's updating, it's uh, changing the database, starting the uh, server again. Now, uh, the, yeah. Now, what we want to do is, um, as we said, we have row level security. So we have to update the bio and say that the database visitor, which is uh, the currently logged in user, is allowed to update this bio. And here we have an error because it's running this migration again and it's trying to add the bio field again to the user, which means, and I think I already mentioned that before, that we need uh, in all of the migration scripts uh, have the code on top that reverts the changes if they already happened uh, before we add our changes. So remove the bio column. Once we save, the code runs, it generates uh, the new types for GraphQL and in the front end, our type error is gone and we can save. What am I doing? Sorry. Um, Maybe, uh, oh, I forgot to mention uh, PostGraph file starter. The graph file starter also comes with uh, GraphQ, Graph, Graph, oh, GraphQL, uh, which is basically, if you know Postman, it's Postman for GraphQL, so you can uh, experiment with your queries in here. Um, if, uh, if we look at it, for example, I can create a new query. Uh, which would, uh, for example, get the username of the current user. And you can see uh, the response immediately here. Uh, once again, if I go to the migration script and remove the bio column that we added before and save the entire thing, the bio will remove even from GraphQL instantly. Uh, maybe you didn't see it. You can look over there and it's back once I save. So it's extremely immediate. There we go. So this kind of concludes our demo. Um, and 
leads us basically to the end already of this presentation. Let's maybe recap, uh, if you have more patience, uh, what I like about PostGraphile and the Graphile Starter. One thing is, as you saw, the immediacy of development. Uh, you change something in the database, you have instant feedback in the front end. Um, the way the security is structured is something that really ticks all my boxes. It's uh, highly secure. If you do a mistake, it's on the database level, and that's where you want that mistake to happen. It probably won't, and it's easy to solve, especially. Um, the database, again, is a single point of truth. Uh, it is not treated as a data dump, and it will probably be in a very good state. Um, it's not necessarily for beginners. You will write way more SQL than you're used to. But the documentation is amazing. Uh, the community on Discord is very helpful. And I think I repeat myself a bit often. The, you will produce code that is very true. Uh, it's can, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. And yes, it's open source. I really like that part. And it's the kind of open source I really like. There's no big corporation, no big funding and investor money behind. Please support them if you don't support anything yet. If you're not a sponsor yet on GitHub and you can afford, just go there and click that button. It will make you as happy as me. Uh, with these words, I would conclude my talk. Um, I'm Pierre Spring. Uh, if you're still watching, I'm a freelance software developer from Switzerland. I've worked for many Swiss companies first and then freelanced in the last 15 years. Um, over the last year or so, um, I, I, sh I started shifting to more international companies through 18. Um, I never thought this could be possible from Switzerland working for a startup in the US. Um, but A-Team uh, has a lot of connections with many startups and it helps freelancers like myself and probably you as well uh, to find interesting projects that pay, I mean, very well. <laughs> um, so if you want to learn more about A-Team, you can just join, go to A-Team slash join. Uh, for me, I went there one month later. I was hooked up with a company in, the, in New York, Apprentice, which is a brilliant life science company. Um, and I thank again, Jean, for letting me taking two days off to prepare this talk. Um, that's it. Questions? Thank you, Pierre. Thank you very much for your talk. It was really, really inspiring and really, really interesting. And I had, had any, I had zero knowledge on GraphQL and stuff like that. So yeah, it was amazing to hear about it. We have some questions for you, and I will take them in a random order. So I'm pretty sure for that. Sorry for that. Um, you wanted to not use not use any database engine for any situation. So do you have any example of bad implementation or when PostgreSQL, for example, was badly used? I find it very difficult to find a possibility where a general purpose database is badly used. But yes, we, uh, with my previous company, we had a client that needed uh, a project that was where a time series database would have been really nice. And uh, that was pre-2013 when InfluxDB started. And this did obviously cost us a lot of time to build ourselves uh, a time series database on top of Postgres. It worked, it performed, mm -hmm. but it, I mean, we had to maintain it and we had bugs, et cetera. So yeah, there might be rare situations where Postgres might be the wrong answer. On the other hand, specialized databases, uh, special purpose databases, there, I have a very strong opinion. They're usually wrong. So, so yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you use them for their purpose and only for their purpose, everything goes well. But if you have only this, so my, my opinion is, okay, we can use uh, uh, um, time series database if we set up Postgres right away in parallel. So we start using Postgres when it's needed. But if I use MongoDB to start uh, tracking uh, of users and I try to make sure that there are no two users with the same email address, 
I will start to have write to write very complicated code mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that something that a transaction will do for free in Postgres does for you. So um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe not. these are opinions, no. right? I, mean, are... I, have, I read a blog post like I think it's been posted yesterday by Kevin Douglas from the PHP community from Symphony, and he wrote that everybody should use Postgres instead of MariaDB and stuff like that. And I have a question for you about that. Why do you think PostgreSQL is not used more often over MySQL or MariaDB? Um, so I haven't used MySQL since my very early days at uh, Leap. And uh, I, I cannot speak for MariaDB because I've never used it. Uh, I think MariaDB comes with pretty sane defaults and could be just as good. I don't know. Uh, I remember that MySQL, and that's very old knowledge, so, you know, 15 years ago, uh, had insane defaults. So if, if you would set a field as required and uh, the query wouldn't pass in the field, it would just add an empty string. So you would write a unit test and the test would pass because you only write... You only use the API yeah, yeah. once in your test. And suddenly you go onto production and you can create one user, but the second user you create just fails because you forgot to pass whatever value. And so, but this probably is very outdated. I yeah. I know Postgres, I don't know the other ones anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No problem. I will post the, the post of Kevin Douglas maybe will help people but the biggest help is just don't read too much blog posts and write more <laughs> <laughs> especially hacker news that makes us crazy ah, you're right um another question from i don't know who is why uh, if the business logic code is in the db can't you run into problem with the version control yeah, that's that was my very so i you're quick because this <laughs> This took me quite a time to figure out that there's a problem. Um, and that, and I, I went to Discord and I was like, how? Like what? I mean, I have a function and it's then migrated. And how am I going to look at it? And the only thing is that you need to shift uh, the way you think about um, where the code lives. The single point of truth of the state of the code currently doesn't live in your code files. It lives in the database. So you need to learn to query the database and look at the functions in the database itself. One thing that's brilliant with regard to that is if you have to work on five different functions uh, for now, because you need to modify them, but they, have a they need to be together for whatever, you just go into the database, you, you get the current state of the definition, you put it on the top of your file and you start modifying it. So when you work, your code is all in the same file. It's it, it's weird, and uh, mm -hmm. not everyone will like it. But yes, your code uh, you cannot read it on GitHub. You will have to check it out, start the DB, and look at the database because it's impossible else. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the follow up of this question from Alain. If you have conflict conflicting code in one branch and merging to another one, do you resolve conflict by into migration or? Ooh, I have no idea. <laughs> so what you do is that you commit your migrations. So you, you have a, in the CLI, you've, you have your current migration where every time you save, it's, it's reapplied. And once your code is done, you commit it and it will create uh, the next number. So if you are at 25, it will be uh, migration 25. Six, mm -hmm. And so if both of us will commit the migration 26, this won't work. So I don't know, but yeah, there, it must be solvable, but certainly not as easily solvable than you'd be used to yeah, uh, I think it's writing. Yeah, your case yeah. scenario. Yeah. Uh, another one question about Postgres SQL. Do you think Postgres SQL JSON type can replace, well, MongoDB? So... Um, as I said, in 99% of the situations, probably. I mean, Notion is, is it called Notion? This uh, yeah. one I, yeah, yeah. I mentioned. This is typically some something where I would see MongoDB strive, right? It, it should be mm -hmm. really good for it. And the fact that they can do this all in Postgres, uh, to me, tells me that in most cases you won't need it. This being said, 
I'm ignorant. I do not yet understand what the, the edge cases are that MongoDB covers very well. And I am sure someone will one day explain it to me and I will be, aha, yes, that's what I need it for. I just didn't, I don't understand it yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, one message, private message from Jorfa told me that maybe you could solve the migration, previous question, migration, migration with timestamp files instead of having uh, 26 and 27. Yeah, I, so to be honest, as I said, I've never worked on, 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 on large scale code base yeah. with Postgres file. I know that it's doable because I know people do it. And these are the kind of problems I've, I've been thinking about it. If the, the timestamps, then what's a timestamp? Is it uh, like if someone works in the US and I work here, then what, how do we resolve these? And do they even make sense? Like, can I, I mean, if I start my migration early, if I check it in earlier, but I never merge it, is it, do they still need to run in or like there are a magnitude of problems that obviously yeah, you get. So. Um, but I think these are interesting to solve. I'd rather solve these kinds of problems than going into my glue code and realizing, oh, foobar, uh, <laughs> I did a select from user and passed in the password to the front, uh, in, <laughs> which will probably not happen if you configure your database correctly uh, with Postgres. Mm -hmm, okay. Yeah. A uh, question about Postgres file. Who does it solve the n plus one problem? It's just joints. I think it uses joints, yes, but I have not looked at the code, to be honest. Magic. It's magic. It's magic. Don't question magic. <laughs> I don't love magic in codes. I don't know why. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Angular. <laughs> No, it's okay. I, I learned to accept Angular as well. <laughs> I have a question about Postgres, PostgreSQL still. Um, do you have a software or tool do you use or you would suggest to query PostgreSQL if you have to um, use UI? Most of, so I've, before doing uh, Postgres file, uh, I, being a Mac hipster, I used uh, Postico. I really like this. Mm -hmm. It's a closed mm -hmm. source program. It doesn't cost too much. It's a, a person in Vienna who develops yeah. it and it's really good. Yet uh, the current version of Postico doesn't give the possibility, I think still to read out the, the stored procedures. It's promised in the next major release. I think you will have to go gray beard on that and work from the command line mostly, which is something you will get used to. The, so the uh, the Postgres read evil print loop REPL. There we go. <laughs> Which is what I'm doing now. Uh, maybe yeah. there's better tools, but I mean, JetBrains has tools that are brilliant. Yeah, I know. Don't use them. Maybe there's better. Option. Again, uh, on Discord mm -hmm. channels, people will uh, point you towards other things. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure, and if you know but anybody on the chat has have a tool, please share it. Um, with Postgres file, can you manage per user security layer for each table's columns? I mean, if a user has specific roles, can they have access to different uh, columns? So you have a security per columns. Yes, that, uh, I think that's what we did. Uh, let me just open our, no, that's not the file I want. Um... So when we did um, this, uh, we added a column. Mm -hmm. um, after adding the column, it's not yet um, accessible to update for users. And we granted on this column uh, the right to update it to the database visitor. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, cool. So, so yes, you, you can do so, it. Yeah. That's pretty... Uh, exactly. Pretty strong, cool. Um, what kind of projects should you typically be run using Postgres file? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, that's a tough question. I don't know. Um, uh, I don't necessarily see a project that's... I don't know. I don't know if a project where you have 50 plus developers working on and you need to recruit quickly mm -hmm. um, would be... The, 
the best because the the learning curve is quite steep and it's not necessarily easy to find developers for it. So maybe that definitely. I um, again, as I definitely lack the experience, and that's a bit sad. <laughs> Someone else should <laughs> give that talk. Um, maybe this isn't even a problem, but from the outside, this could be. Yeah, what about kind book? you wouldn't do? Uh, I would definitely do all my private projects with it because um, it gives me joy. Uh, mm -hmm. We're trying with my partner to write a little application to uh, s store our recipes about delicious food. And obviously, this will never see the world, but this is what we're currently working on. Mm -hmm. um, what about the POC? What do you think about proof of concept using Postgre file? Because the startup If you know it, you're really quick. If, I if think you so, know yeah. it, you're extremely quick. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, there are other things like... Uh, I mean, just uh, I've seen, for example, people who are who have not been developing for years uh, uh, and who have been in management coming back to coding, uh, mm -hmm. doing things very quickly with what was it called? Let me okay. GitHub. You should not Google when people look at you. This one. Mm. Um, can you see tech stack? Exactly, they use Prisma, uh, mm -hmm. which is, okay. uh, I think it's more reminiscent of the days where you write a big YAML file that will create uh, your structure and write it to a database. But, I mean, you're probably, if you have no experience, you're probably quicker off with that. Um, so, but again, uh, using it for for prototyping is definitely good if you have certain experience, especially because uh, this prototype you can put live and your data will not get corrupted. Your uh, you have it deployed within minutes on Heroku. Everything is prepared and documented very well. Yeah. I still have two last questions for you. Um, maybe you don't have, but do you have any? Do you know any big project or still project using GraphQL? Graphil. Was Graphene, sorry. Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if Zoom they have some. It, I think where I know there is a list. Is it here? Give me one second. Let me Google this for you. No, I don't know. Yeah, don't, don't worry. It was my, my question. I was pretty sure we have nothing. But I know that the creator uh, is, has been using it uh, before open sourcing it for mm -hmm. most, if not all of their client projects through their agency. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, okay. And the last question we had, uh, does the documentation of PostgreSQL has any sandbox or example projects so people can just dig in it and look at it? That, that's, that's what Graphile Starter is for. Hmm. They have so basically, uh, if I, I can just... This is just not as organized as it could be. It's a brilliant readme, but uh, you have to start with getting started. So it's not at the top, but you start, you can either work in Docker where you have your entire VS okay. code in within Docker, running within Docker, or you can run it outside. You just set up Postgres and you have it running. You run setup, which does create all the databases you need. Basically, Graphile Migrate has two databases, the, the state before the migration and the current state, so it can quickly overwrite them. So it, it does all that setup for you. Then you run your yarn start. Uh, funnily, before you do everything, you have to run the making it yours part, where you <laughs> edit two or three files and you're done. And then yeah. you have this uh, thing that I showed you that's also deployed online. Uh, which is a little Europe. project, which again, what's wonderful is on the first page, it tells you, oh, now you have it running. Okay, read this, read that. Here we go, blah, here, now, yeah, go on. Oh, by the way, pretty, this, yeah. read this later, not now, but you will need this at some point. So it, it, it takes mm -hmm. you by the hand and you can immediately sign in using GitHub and it works. Crazy, thank you. Well, I think we finished, so... Thank you again, Pierre, for everything, for your talk. And 
I'm pretty excited to use it in production, or maybe not production, but at least for some project and try it on. Oh, if you need a like freelancer that. for that, I'm yours. Any project that <laughs> will have Postgraph file, I will make a very good rate. Yeah, I will maybe I will check with Jill. <laughs> thank you, Pierre. I will give the hand to Joshua to terminate this one, Maddie. So thank you again. Have a nice evening and see you soon. Thank you. It's yours, Joshua. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Pierre, for this interesting talk. So, um, even though the, the 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 situation the sanitary situation is not that good, we still continue the web mardi, and the next web mardi will happen in January uh, 2022. Uh, it will be about um, how to advertise your products, service to developers. So basically more talk uh, for people that want to learn how to promote things. Um, it's not technical at all. So you can, everyone can join basically that talk. And it's given by Monica. Uh, and the talk will happen on the 11th of January. So you can join it on YouTube. Go on youtube.com slash webmardi and you will be able to join the live meeting. Uh, for 2022, we have plenty of meetups already planned. Um, I don't know if we already have them uh, on our website, but soon we will publish them. So um, we're going to talk about Unix, about design. So there is already plenty of talks that are planned. Uh, and we are really looking forward for having you again in 2022. Um, something different but uh, one of our sponsor leap is looking for uh, people to hire people like drupal developers full, full stack dev uh, php dev people can work from Bern, lausanne fribourg whatever from home so it's really open you can subscribe uh, by going on their website on leap.ch slash jobs Voila. Uh, of course, <laughs> the WebMardi is a non-profitable association. Uh, so we are looking for sponsor for people that can help us. Um, as an individual, you can always help us through patreon.com slash and um, helping us uh, financially. As a company, uh, you can contact us and uh, we have different sponsoring plan that we can present. Um, and of course, uh, if you don't have money, but time, we're always looking for people that could help us to make this web money happening. So um, you don't need to, 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 to know how to code or, I mean, we just need like arms to help us when we do uh, talks, like to just bring the upper road to the office, stuff like that. So, voila. Uh, if ever you're interested to join WebMardi, you can also contact us through contact at webmardi.ch. Um, as usual, you can always um, check the other videos that we made for uh, all the other events that were uh, online or physical. We always um, register them uh, on YouTube. So check them out. and. Um, if ever you have any question, you have any interest in giving a talk, just ping us at contact at webmardi.ch. I'm really happy uh, uh, with all of you tonight. And thank you very much for being present. Thank you very much, Pierre, for his talk. Thank you very much for everyone involved in the webmardi. And see you soon. Bye.